it unless legislation, unless Congress opens it up for a whole brand new set of uh, census tracts. The main purpose of Opportunity Zone is to get private sector funding in places that have really been bypassed for years in terms of uh, uh, their rural economy or their urban or rural economy. Uh, and these are particularly typically places that never really uh, rebounded uh, from the Great Recession and have continued to be really lagging behind the rest of the country. So this was designed to infuse private sector funding in the hopes that this would spur uh, economic and community development growth. A uh, little bit about our, our Rural Opportunity Zone project. It was awarded by a Rural Business Development Grant in 2019 uh, by USDA Rural Development. Uh, our intent was to work with five to six Rural Opportunity Zones. We have 156 Opportunity Zones in Indiana, of which 46 of these are defined as rural. Uh, the, so we Who would you like to FaceTime with? What's that? No one. Uh, so the, the whole thing was- I won't uh, do it. The whole thing was designed to uh, uh, do it on a competitive basis, and the, and five of them were six of them were chosen. One actually did not make it, uh, did not couldn't make get it done, uh, and so we officially started in 2019. So we did a lot of things with them. We gave them a kickoff webinar about the big picture about what this whole initiative is about. Conducted one-on-one -on -one webinars with each site. We did face-to-face -face workshops. We were build, build, building capacity, helping them really understand what they had to put together to really build an investment perspectives. And then we had to revise our whole face-to-face -face plan because of COVID. And that really set us behind. As a result, we had to ask for a six-month extension to be able to re, kind of regroup and begin to figure out how we can deliver this capacity building program on a virtual basis. So in, in many respects, I like to think about, we were really building the plane as we were flying it, uh, as, we, as we developed this investment prospectus. And what we did is we began to look at, first of all, what do we mean by investment prospectus? It's a project that the community would have that accurately demonstrate the projects that they were looking for private sector funding. It talks about their community priorities. It really is something that is, they felt is important and is achievable and includes a variety of different strategies and examples of, of uh, other projects that they've done that are demonstrative how this uh, community is really on the move. Uh, it's not complicated, it's not really detailed. It's not like a strategic plan had to be very, very focused but it demonstrates strong sound preparation, uh, project development, and a good sustainable plan. So what we did to try to get a better understanding about what should be an investment prospectus is we looked at different things on site. What were, what were uh, opportunity zone investment prospectus that were out there? Uh, but most of them were really urban based. Very few of them, if any, had anything related to rural communities. So we did, uh, we tried to gain, gain as much as we could from that, but had to keep digging. So we asked for advice from experts uh, who were really, uh, who manage uh, uh, qualified opportunity funds. Uh, we used our own knowledge and experiences from the different people we had. We all come with different strengths and we try to build on those. And, and all that zero helped us learn a good bit about uh, those elements that we felt were gonna be critical to include in the investment perspectives. So this is kind of what we did for the first phase of uh, this phase with one to five or six communities we worked with. Here's how we felt they should build their investment perspectives by looking at introduction, the brief history, why the perspective, letter from key official, uh, things about their community, including some data, uh, what makes them uniquely important, excuse me. Uh, uh, targeted, then had to identify two target projects. Uh, we didn't want to go too big, wanted them to hone in on a couple of projects and really do a great job demonstrating the value of those. Then talk about why do you, uh, why do we want the investor to invest in this opportunity zone. Uh, talk about the, the history of collaboration among these groups, success stories in the past, and, uh, and, and what local investments might be, uh, have been in evidence in past years, and then other pertinent information. So this is kind of uh, what we want to tell them is here's the kinds of projects that really would be consistent with what Opportunity Zones have been able to fund uh, in the past. Something on housing, on tech parks, on uh, business expansion, reuse of facilities, multifamily housing, whatnot. So we gave them kind of a, a list of about eight or nine different areas where they could consider uh, uh, investing. That gave them kind of a roadmap of what projects would be doable and fundable uh, with regard to this program. 
So this is kind of what we came up with. We built a very, very nice polished investment prospectus for them. Uh, and it looks very, we thought was very attractive. And they could then take this and begin to uh, you put it on their website and be able to use it as a hard copy to share with people who might be interested in their opportunity zone. And this is kind of what part of what the inside looks like. We this, this doesn't cover everything we had in there, but we had a letter from from uh, the mayors. In this case, we had two mayors who had joined forces, two opportunity zones. A letter from them, then the kind of a layout of the what this uh, document uh, constitutes. And if you look at key assets, if you can see this, we didn't go too detailed. We want to highlight just key assets that really demonstrate that this is a great place to invest in. Same thing with the data. We didn't give them a whole slew of tables. We gave them highlights of key data points that, again, say this is really a very good place uh, to invest because they have, you know, they have, uh, they have, uh, you know, they have a lot of by, by populations growing. The educational level is high. Home ownership is high. All things that we think are positive attributes. Then you'll see how an example of a, of a, of a project and some of the key information we provided and then demonstrate this is the kinds of things we've been doing and we want this project or these projects to build on the momentum that we currently have and then a little brief history about the community and finally what's the what's the benefit to the investor in terms of the financial gain that they, they would that they would uh, that they would be able to realize as a result of their investment in this particular opportunity zone so, and then we worked quite a bit with them about the variety of different ways where we could market this project. The Opportunity Investment Consortium is something we have in Indiana. It's constituted of different private and public sector entities that are working collaboratively on helping support investment perspectives, uh, investment, uh, you know, the, the Opportunity Zone Program in Indiana. Then the e Economic Innovation Group, they're key people nationally. And then all these other groups, we try to look at different ways in which we can get the word out about these different projects. So uh, here's what we've done. We did get funding again from, from USDA for the same program for phase two, which we've launched now in 2021. And I want to tell you what some of the lessons we learned as we get into Rosie two. One is we want to clarify the roles of, of, uh, of the of us as the state team, as well as the local uh, projects, the local communities that were part of the Opportunity Zone. First of all, we had to clarify whose responsibilities are what. Second of all, we had to fine tune what should be involved or included in that prospectus. Third, we wanted to give them a better, a, a greater depth of and, and breadth of projects that might be applicable with regard to uh, opportunity zones, what those that would be fundable. And then how can we have them find funding, both, both internal, uh, external, public and private, uh, philanthropic to see if they could help them get these projects funded. So here's a, a very quick example. We create a much more I think succinct way to organize themselves as a core action team of a small number of people, an advisor team, a larger group that'd be uh, involved, uh, not all the time, but on a periodic basis to serve as a sounding board for the core action team and then engage the community. And I see Melinda Grismer is on. Melinda was the one who spearheaded all of our focus groups to get the community buy-in uh, on, this, on this whole effort. And you can see our state Rosie team is really involved in all three levels. Uh, this, I'm not going to go through all this, but I want to just share with you that we laid out these roles and responsibilities so there was no doubt about what their responsibilities were and what we would be doing. So we have a core action team. They are the ones who are really the drivers. We have the advisory team, again, as a sounding board, provide advice, input, reaction to different proposals. We had the community members, and like as I indicated, Melinda and others on our team are really spearheading opportunities to hear from the public. Because one thing we were really trying to guard against is being accused of doing to the community or to that opportunity zone, as opposed to ensuring that they had a voice and making sure that those projects that were being decided were done with full understanding, full engagement of the people and businesses in that, in that opportunity zone. So they were a total partner in this effort. And then we laid out what our state responsibilities would be. Uh, and then we began to think about, as, and this is something that, that we're now 
getting ready to do with our Rosie 2, and that is we're going to have a workshop, and we're going to have them build the data you need for each of these I I items. What are the key areas that you want to focus on? What strategies are you going to use? What's your value proposition? What makes you know, what compelling message can you make about why this is important to invest in our community? And what's been evidence of the vibrant nature of your community? What are some local things you've done? Projects that have been completed that demonstrate this is a this is a community in, in, in a positive move. Uh, how are you going to market it? And what are some of the support, the assets you have that can really help? And then we, the, the other thing is, what are the additional incentives, local incentives? It could be, it could be tax deferment, uh, tax abatement. It could be state uh, uh, incentives that may be available. We want them to understand that not only are this, these are projects that we'd like you to invest, but these are going to be the additional investments that you'll have uh, incentives that you'll have access to if you invest in, in these communities. And then we gave them a much better, uh, I guess, demonstration of the core areas where funding is taking place across the country. It's commercial property, housing, all sorts of housing, uh, business operations, and then hospitality. Most of these are going into the commercial business and housing, some, some to hospitality, but these are, housing has probably been the most important thing in which opportunity zones are being used. And then we gave them some ideas on funding sources where you might be able to find not only opportunity zones, but other ways in which you could find ways to, to uh, determine uh, resources that might be available, including the latest American Rescue Plan that was passed by Congress uh, under the leadership of President Biden. So, that, so that's really uh, the key uh, about our program. And, and I hope I've given you, uh, hopefully I'm just about Cliff on about right time here for, for this. Yes, you're right on time. So we do have about four or five minutes for questions. And again, I want to acknowledge my co my co conspirators, Melinda and Julie <laughs> Rigorich, and my colleagues, uh, at least from the PCRD from Purdue University. Melinda, uh, anything you want to add? Melinda, anything you want to add? No, I think you covered it really well and very succinctly, Bo. Um, it was a, a year of learning. Um, learning from the communities. And as we start to implement Rosie too, I think we're gonna take a lot of that into helping this next cohort of six um, really be successful. But, um, but yeah, I, I feel like um, the, first, the first five of our six really had a lot of value from it too. And just, just a team to work through yeah. um, all the ins and outs of which projects to choose and how to market those and how to, how to really get the community buy-in. Um, really, yeah, let yeah. me just, this say, and just, uh, just a minor point, uh, a, quick, a key question is, is anything happening? Well, one of our communities, for example, they decided they, what they really needed was a intergenerational campus and they were gonna, they were gonna build, the proposal was to build a uh, senior living facility as well as a childcare facility. And the third leg would be a medical facility. And right now they already have things in place for the senior living, the childcare facilities now getting funding. And the only thing that's still lacking now is can we build a, a medical clinic that provide service to inter, uh, all, all generations from elderly to, to children. And so that's, so that's just evidence that things are moving in a town of, what is it, more than 1,400 people. Yeah. Bo, well, there's a question uh, in the chat from Chris Cribbs. What were some of the lessons learned? Well, again, one thing that, and again, I'll ask Melinda to help me out here. One of the key lessons we learned is that when we went in there, we had anticipated that they would take the leadership, not only in helping identify the projects, but they would be the ones who would put together the investment prospectus. We began to realize, you know, they never realized that was their role. And, and, and Melinda will agree, we, that really created a bottleneck. We took leadership, said, okay, give us the raw data, give us the raw information, we will organize it then in a fashion that we think will really be polished. And we did that. So we made it real, we realized that was one of the big lessons. The second, I think the lesson is that we had to make sure they gave voice to the people and the businesses that were in that opportunity. So we, and they didn't get that because it was becoming initially was more the traditional. You know, the, the, the regular the regular people, the local government, economic development people said, no, nah, you got to reach beyond the boundaries of your team and get more people in the community involved. And that's where Melinda has done a super job making sure that would happen. Melinda, you have anything else you want to add? Yeah, I, I agree with both of those things. And in the first point, we really learned we had to give them a structured way to provide us that raw data and 
and show them kind of, and that's where that lean prospectus that he showed you in that slide kind of came, came in to kind of show them step by step what we needed to build the components of that prospectus. And I think that was really critical because um, just helping them map map it out and know exactly what components to contribute um, and you know really setting those expectations for what part we could help with like for instance with the data and with the community buy-in through focus right. groups but yeah, what right. parts they had to deliver to us um, that were just boots on the ground information whether it was their local plans that they had already um, you know had already completed that they could pull from or whether it was you know letters from local elected officials or what it, whatever components they had. Yeah, this is the slide where we kind of help them identify which components they needed to contribute and which ones we needed to yeah. contribute. Yeah. But, but when I said we were building a plan, I really meant it because we were, we were not sure ourselves what should be in it. And through experience and trial and error, this, these are ones we realized were the critical ones uh, to include. And if anybody's interested, and in, uh, I think the PowerPoint will be made available to all of you, but if anybody's interested, we'll be glad to share the uh, one or two copies. You know, if you want to see the investment perspectives to get a better feel of how we organize it, let us know. Let Melinda and myself know. We'll be glad to, uh, to send you a copy of that electronically. Good. Um, well, thank you very much. And Melinda and everybody, thanks for, for uh, sharing your information. We're, we're right on schedule and uh, Stephen Menno has joined us. And just as a reminder, I'm recording this to the cloud and it'll be made available to conference participants as well as, as, as both said, also the PowerPoints will be made available. So uh, Stephen, I, I've made you co-host. So if you've got slides to show, you can share them now and, and, and third, and you've got uh, about 20 minutes uh, and then we'll have, uh, we'll move on to the third one. So Stephen, it's your show now. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Cliff. Um, all right, let me just share my screen. So if everyone can see that, I just like to um, introduce uh, myself. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephen Mino. I'm from the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension, and I'm here presenting with my colleague Penelope Whitman. So Penelope, do you want to take it over? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Penelope, I'm with UNH Cooperative Extension. I'm based in a county office in a rural part of New Hampshire in Sullivan County. And Stephen, shall I just say that you're based in, in a more urban part of the state. Stephen and I collaborated on this project together. Um, this was work that was offered, you know, I was reached out to by this organization. We'll get into this in a, in a minute. And I reached out to Stephen because of his background um, in regional planning, which is a great way to work work together based on skills and experience. Oh, thank, thanks, Penelope. You give a better introduction of myself than I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before we begin, um, you know, just standard Zoom webinar protocols, you know, uh, I think you all have got it, you know, just remain muted when you're not talking. Feel free to share your video, though. We do love to see people's faces, although everyone has great uh, professional headshots. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, please feel free to use the chat box to, you know, share your comments, questions. Uh, we really encourage you to ask questions, share your ideas. And so we are gonna try to answer the questions as the presentation goes along. Penelope and I are kind of just planning on making this a little bit more informal, hopefully a little interactive, um, but just for the sake of time and you know, just um, to make sure we get to everything, we may save some of those questions for the end. So with that, Penelope. So uh, Stephen and I, well, I guess I, I should say that um, I had, been involved with, um, been in meetings with the, the uh, executive director of the Regional Planning Commission, which is um, an organization which has a large service area that includes the county where I'm working, but uh, also other regions. And I had been asked maybe a, a year before this work that Stephen and I did together to facilitate a staff retreat um, for that organization. And that had gone really well. I had done that service for the RPC at no charge. And it was interesting because that brought this, this more involved process to, to me and to Stephen, to extension. Um, and so the, the RPC reached out and said, you know, we're having 
Um, we've had a lot of staff transition. The ED who had reached out to me before had left. There was um, <coughs> an interim ED in place. And it was clear that the organization had some challenges. And so they reached out and said, oh, can you help us um, do some strategic planning? We've got internal issues. We've got some external issues. And we have this interim ED and we just need some help figuring out what, what to do. Um, and so we organized this process for the RPC. And this is why we're bringing it to you because we organized it iteratively and it was such a functional and helpful project that um, we wanted to share it with everybody. Um, I, I'll also say just for some additional context for our people who've never been sure. Um, and so, so you can kind of get a mind of what the region we were working in. The Upper Valley, like Sunapee region is kind of uh, multiple regions in one. You the, would probably be most familiar with it being the location of Dartmouth University. Um, uh, but it's along the lines of the Connecticut River Valley uh, bordering Vermont. So just to provide some extra context there. And it's also might be helpful for some of you in uh, different states to know in New Hampshire, regional planning commissions are mostly serve an advisory role. In other states, they have a lot they have a lot more authority uh, that's given to them by legislation um, and they can tend to be more active participants in gearing development, uh, reviewing development. So we'll talk a little bit more about how the advisory role in New Hampshire was really one of the sticking points for this organization. So as Penelope said, uh, really what we were brought in and hired, so I used to work for a regional planning commission in New Hampshire, so that's why Penelope sort of recruited me to help with this strategic planning effort. Um, and we had three really main objectives that we wanted to work with this group on, which was helping them understand sort of the regional challenges and the potential for their future work that they could do together. Um, this is all taking place during the pandemic, just as uh, for reference as well. Um, and really strengthen the connection between the executive committee, who you can almost think of, um, if you're familiar with nonprofit organizations, this is sort of the board side entity of it. So these are all volunteers who are part of the community who help with the governance of the organization, but not the day-to-day -day operations. And so really strengthen that um, uh, connection between the committee and then the staff also who are working and doing the day-to-day -day work. And um, the last piece, as Penelope mentioned, there you know, was a lot of executive director turnover. Um, there were some other organizational issues. So really to helping them develop some strategies to enhance that organizational functionality was sort of our third charge that we were brought in to help with. And, and one thing I think I'll add to that was that the board um, had gone through a whole interview process for a new ED. And when it came time to make the final decision, they suddenly thought, yeesh, we don't even know what our priorities are as an organization. So we don't know how to choose an executive director. We don't know what particular skills or expertise we should be looking for. So we need to better understand um, what the the organization's priorities are and on the ed side uh the interim ed said you know this board doesn't really understand what the purview of an rpc is and the kinds of things that an rpc can do and can't do so there was a lot of you know missing information and um issues around communication that was clear so our methodology was we to figure out what the regional issues were, we decided we'd conduct a key informant interviews with um, the executive committee, this board, the staff members of the organization, and then the larger commission, so municipal reps from all the municipalities in the service region and some organizational partners. We got a list from the interim ED. She helped us identify who we needed to talk to. Stephen and I divided up that list and we organized a, you know, a brief Qualtrics survey form that we used for ourselves, 
but we did the interviews on the telephone and then keyed in the responses for ourselves so we could easily process the data later. Um, so we made all those calls and talked to all those folks. Um, then we analyzed the data that came in and it was pretty clear from the data that we had nine key challenges that were facing the region. And then what the organizational, the internal, and also what we called outward facing organizational issues were for the organization. We also looked into the bylaws and the, the relevant RSAs for RPCs in the state so that we could help educate the commissioners on what an RPC is, what their purview is, what they were um, mandated to do and what they could and could not do. Um, and just as a side note, this just dawned on me, uh, to help give a little more context about what the law states for um, an RPC can do in New Hampshire, um, regional planning commissions in New Hampshire also don't receive much funding from the state. So they only receive about $10,000 annually from the state to do all their operations. So that leaves RPCs searching for a lot of external funding as well, which came, kept coming up as a recurring theme during this. So um, because this was all happening during the pandemic and you know these issues with the interim executive director and the staff, we, Penelope and I couldn't design a process that we would have normally done, which might have involved an all day retreat, um, maybe multiple conversations. You know, we were kind of stuck with doing that in this virtual environment. And so that really reduced sort of what our options were. And we really wanted to strategize, well, how can we make this effective, engaging, knowing that a full day virtual retreat was probably not gonna be feasible, you know, in capturing people's attention in keeping them engaged and to building that safe environment. So what we decided to do was uh, take this retreat and span it over two days uh, where we were only having an hour and a half session each day. So that really limited the amount of face-to-face -face contact time we had with the staff and the executive directors to really review the findings of our interviews with all the people and help them strategically plan for the future. The thing we also took a lot of consideration into when we were designing this retreat was, you know, we had to address the power dynamics that were involved in this situation. The, the board had just gone through a search process with this interim director involved. They, um, they uh, technically are the governing board of the organization. So they're kind of the bosses of the executive director. The executive director is the supervisor for the staff. So we wanted to create an environment where people could, you know, be able to critique the organization and talk a little more freely about what they uh, saw as challenges facing the region, saw ways that they could improve in a safe and secure way where no one felt they were risking sort of their professional uh, stake. Um, and so one of the things that we did to help manage that is we didn't want to share any of the findings before the retreat. We really wanted everyone to come in sort of um, at the same level of knowledge. And we'll talk about the tools and techniques we use during this retreat, but what we decided to do was split the retreat into the two days. The first day was really focusing on those key challenges facing the region, you know. Um, and then the second day was focusing more on how do we function as an organization? What are the issues that we need to resolve in order to meet these key challenges? And what are our roles gonna be going forward? So we, we wanted to just briefly share the, the key findings of our research because, you know, we're all in community and economic development and we're facing these same issues wherever we're working. These, the regional challenges are ranked in terms of the priority as we identified in the, in the key informant interviews. So they were the number one issue up here is housing, fiscal sustainability for towns, we definitely saw a limited awareness of civic best, best practices. Folks in towns not, not knowing you know, the best way to um, make decisions, uh, limit, limited governance capacity. Definitely a, an issue in New England is resistance to collaboration and cooperation in, between communities. 
Broadband is a big issue up here. Changing demographics because of um, migration based on COVID, um, climate change, amenity migration, public health issues, and outdoor recreation management. Those were the um, regional challenges that, that we identified in our key informant interviews. And so some of those organizational issues that we found in discussing with the staff, uh, discussing, you know, we asked staff what was working in the organization, and we also asked external partners what it was like, uh, what their perceptions of the organization were, what their past experiences working with the organization had been like. Um, so we found within the organization, um, the employees felt that there were really unclear processes to do things. Um, you know, they had so much executive director turnover. It was really a question of who steward, you know, um, who's really going to be the stewards of this organization? Should it be the executive director? Is it the board? Had it become the staff? And this disconnection in the relationship between the commissioners, these volunteer boards, and, and the staff themselves. Um, outward facing you know, there definitely seemed to be uh, a need for better uh, advocacy of what the organization did. They needed to improve their public relations with uh, municipalities about services they could offer, ways they could be of help. Um, and there was really a lack of clarity around roles and responsibilities. So after, uh after we shared the regional challenges, the first activity we did in day one of the retreat was to send people into breakout groups, big breakout rooms that included two commissioners, two board members essentially, and two staff, because everything we did, we wanted to increase the, the build the relationships between the board and the staff. And so in this exercise, these four people in each breakout group, um, we assigned them a couple of the, exactly, I think it was three of the um, issues, the regional challenges, and asked them to talk about what the RPC had been doing and what the RPC possibly could do. So it was a chance for the commissioners to learn about what the RPC had been doing because they really didn't have a sense of what the organization had been doing. And then to learn also about how the RPC worked and how they, how they take on projects, how they decide um, what projects they're gonna do and, and their role in projects across the region. So um, we also divided those issues up so that each breakout group had a top priority issue, a medium priority issue and a low priority issue in terms of how they had come in ranked in our research. So that was a really productive exercise. I think they had lively discussions and they came up with a bunch of possible new interventions. Uh, this is just up there for you to see um, that they produced a bunch of ideas. I think they were quite engaged in the conversations. And so that kind of ended our first day of the retreat. And what we decided to do was start off the second day to create a safer space for people to give feedback on how they thought the, re the retreat was going so far. And so we decided to create a poll everywhere so people could anonymously respond to these questions that we were posing. So you didn't know if it was a commissioner, you didn't know if it was a staff. So people felt a little more secure. And so here's an example of what we had of just, you know, what opportunities were people seeing arise out of this retreat? And it could have been, you know, like um, some of those new interventions they had brainstormed the previous day. It could be just things that they were seeing in the changing dynamics between the commissioners and the staff. So that was our way to kind of safely launch um, the second day of the retreat. I think we were really excited when we, you know, posed that question on poll everywhere and, and all of these responses flowed in. They were clearly um, engaged and had left the day before thinking about the RPC, thinking about the work they could do and came in full of all these ideas and, and sort of hope which was great to see. We did another exercise where we sent them into breakout rooms, which is what you do in Zoom, right? Um, and this time we paired uh, a board member with a staff. So we had just very small groups, just um, two people. And we asked them to post to um, 
Stephen, I'm blanking on what uh, this Padlet. Whole, Padlet. Um, we had briefed them on the internal issues at this point, the outward facing internal issues of, of how there was a lack of perception of what the RPC did, how communities really didn't understand the scope of RPCs and, and how to work with an RPC. Um, and so we wanted them to address this situation, the perception of the RPC and think about roles. So what could the executive director do? What could the full commission members do? What could the board do? And what could the staff do? And so in this setting with one commissioner and one staff, they keyed in their ideas um, into Padlet. And as they came in, uh, Stephen and I, you know, sorted them into columns for the ED, the commission, the staff, the board, um, and ended up with this huge list of things that different groups, you know, the different uh, roles could tackle. I think the executive director was actually really overwhelmed because there were so many in her category. <laughs> Hey, Stephen and Penelope, um, you've got about maybe five minutes to wrap it up. Okay, okay great. Okay, Thank great, you. Great. So, um, so basically, after the retreat, what we did was we collected not only all the findings that Penelope and I had researched with speaking to everyone, but also all the data and information that came out of the strategic retreat, um, just like that Padlet. And we, uh, Penelope and I, put our heads together and we drafted some recommendations for all those different various stakeholders going forward and into a report that we then sent to the executive director and then. And the board. And so, you know, this was just a couple of months ago that we finalized the work with the RPC. Um, since then, some great things have happened and I we both feel really good about where we left the RPC. The interim ED was hired um, by the board and um, she has just launched into some work with, with her staff or uh, clarifying protocols. Um, she's continuing to do a roadshow in the different municipalities, sharing what the RPC does and how it can work with each municipality. Um, and one thing that's been great for, for um, extension is that there's this newfound um, relationship between the RPC and extension where the ED you know, reaches out for support really and um, guidance from, from me because I'm the person in the county. Um, and there have been all these grants for regional work that I've been asked to be, you know, participate in as a, as a thought leader and, and a contributor because of this, this strengthened relationship with the RPC. So um, feel really good about the project. And so uh, that's it in a nutshell of what we did. And if anyone has any questions, I mean, feel free to post them in the chat. I know we only have a couple minutes left, but also feel free to reach out to us, Penelope or myself about, you know, uh, trying to do these strategic planning sessions uh, in a remote environment, working with regional planning commissions. Uh, we'll be happy to answer anyone's emails. So folks, we do have time for a few questions. Um, the easiest way to do it is in the chat. I don't have everybody's um, uh, Zoom screen up, so I can't see raising of hands. But if anybody, I'll, I'll keep scrolling through to see if I see any. And I, I don't see any hands. And I, at this moment, I, okay, here's the question in the chat. What did you like best about using Padlet? Um, I think Penelope, you and I can both answer this. I mean, I like that it was free. So that made, <laughs> you know, um, uh, that made that handy. Um, what was great about it was it was a screen that even people in separate breakout groups could all see in real time, you know, updating um, and responding. We also like that, you know, the flexibility of moving around the boxes. Um, yeah, Penelope, is there anything you want to add to that? It's fun. And I think when you're looking at a screen, um, it's just a different, it's a different, you know, uh, platform to look at the bricks. You know, it's fun. You see things popping up there. It's very active. I think people feel like, um, yeah, it worked as a sticky wall. It really did. 
Um, I, I really liked it. Oh, what a what a great analogy, Melinda. That's nice. Thank you. Um, so a, a, a question from Michael, the whole thing about splitting a retreat into two days, pros and cons of your thoughts. Um, so, I mean, I think, and Penelope, feel free to jump in, but I think it really actually worked to our benefit by doing that because as Penelope said, people weren't just overwhelmed with discussions and sort of these long drawn out conversations built into one day. They could sort of, you know, let the ideas marinate from the first day um, after the, um, and then bring that back to the second day with sort of a renewed energy. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, I think the sign of a good retreat is, is when people don't want to leave. So the second day, you know, there were so many more discussions to have and the commissioners were really engaged and enlivened and, um, you know, we had to end on time and the commissioners were saying, oh my gosh, there's so many more things to discuss, but that's how you want a board to feel that, that they're, they suddenly know what to talk about and they feel empowered. Um, so I thought it worked really well. And I like doing it to, instead of, you know, say two, two Tuesdays with a week in between, I think it's good to do two consecutive days. Mm -hmm. So any, any, any last questions? I'll scroll, scroll through and see if I see anybody's hand up. Uh, which I don't, and I don't see anything in chat. Oh, here we go. Um, how about the how about the New Hampshire thing? Live free or die. Is that part of the resistance to cooperation? Definitely. <laughs> yeah, totally. We could do a whole presentation on that. But yeah, I think in a nutshell, it's a it's a yeah. I it's mean, a mi micro. Yeah. Yeah. It's I just, mean, the, it's made very locally here. It's very yeah. very micro governance. Mm -hmm. It's challenging. <laughs> yeah. And and what we talked about in the retreat is the state enabling legislation doesn't really promote it either. Yeah. So. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's great. That's interesting. A little local flavor. Um, and again, thank you guys uh, for your for your presentation and for staying right on time. And if you'll stop sharing your screen, we'll shift over to Ramona. And Ramona, you've got 25 minutes, so um, 20, 25 minutes, and, and then we'll get everybody out on time. Thank you again. So Ramona, you're up. All right, thank you so much, Cliff. Are we ready to get started? We are, we're ready to go. Perfect, well, thanks everyone for joining our session today. My name is Ramona Madusing hector I'm a regional specialized agent in urban sustainability. I want to introduce Linda and Alicia. They will introduce themselves. They are my co-presenters today. Hi, everyone. Linda Seals, Regional Specialized Agent, Community Resource Development. I'm on the East Coast of Florida. And I am also in Florida, in the Florida Keys, and I'm Alicia Betancourt. I'm the Monroe County Extension Director, but my appointment is in Community Development as well. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. So here is a quick overview of what we will be covering today in our session. We'll take a look at the background for our work. We'll explore the methodology and tools. We will share our results with you. We'll talk about impact and lessons learned. And along the way, you'll see a couple of reflection questions for the chat box and we'll have discussion time at the end. So we'll go ahead and get started and we're turning it over to Linda. All right, thank you, Ramona. So just a quick glance here, looking at the map of Florida and that yellow spot there you see over on the East Coast is where most of our discussion today took place in Brevard County, Florida. And just a little bit of background about Brevard County. Some of you may have heard of NASA and you may have heard of SpaceX and you may have heard of the Kennedy Space Center. And if you have, all three of those entities, well, there's Blue Origin as well, Jeff Bezos from Amazon. Yeah, Blue Origin is also there. So all, you know, it's big space industry here in Florida, here in Brevard County. And you might think that because of that, you know, we are just, you know, one nerdy county full of all kinds of sustainability and resilience initiatives, but you would be wrong in thinking that. Um, Brevard County is very much behind the state in these areas working in sustainability and resiliency, which is uh, distressing to many people because we are facing sea level rise issues as a result of climate change. 
And then, you know, Florida as a whole has a, a pretty good sustainability network. We have the Florida Sustainability Directors Network. We have the Pinellas County, which is where Ramona is, Sustainability and Resilience Network. And then we have the Southeast Climate, Florida Climate Compact, which I know Alicia is very active in. So we do have a lot of things going on in Florida and some areas of the state are more active and more progressive than others. On the next slide, um, kind of take a look at how did this Brevard Sustainability Working Group come about? It, it started as um, some people observed that there were a lot of silos in the county, a lot of agencies, organizations, nonprofits, governments, we're all working in a silo and no one was communicating with each other. No one was sharing resources. We weren't network, networking and things just were not getting done. We, we have a body of water here called the Indian River Lagoon, which is a, um, a, a very important estuary. And it's a national, it's, it's a designated as, I forget the exact designation, but it, it's a pretty important body of water and it's severely imp impaired. Think of the Chesapeake Bay a few years ago, and that's where we are with the Indian River Lagoon. So we said, you know what, we need to organize. And so we did, and we have, we don't have an official membership. People can just ask to become members and they're members. We conducted a needs assessment, which I'll talk about more in a moment. And we are currently working on a strategic plan. But while we're doing this, you know, if you put in the chat box there, what motivates you to be an engaged board member? And if we could go to the next slide, Ramona, while folks are entering in the chat box if they feel so inclined. You know, one of the reasons that the working group was put together is because there was an effort by the local communities. We have 17 municipalities in Brevard County and all 17 municipalities were doing their own thing. And we recognized that they were forming these sustainability groups or they're appointing boards, they were forming committees. And most of the people who made up these boards and committees were folks who had no experience whatsoever working with local governments. And we were hearing that there was a lot of frustration. A lot of these boards were not meeting frequently because of quorum issues. And it was just, um, there, there was just a lot of frustration out there. So. The working group decided to create a vision and mission statement, which we did, and our focus was to be entirely on those, those committees and those boards. And one of the questions we asked in the needs assessment, which we did in 2019, and this needs assessment was just sent out to the boards and the committees. And I, I go back and forth between boards and committees because some are, some are referred to as boards and some are referred to as committees, and there's a legal difference there. So that's why I refer to those differently. But what needs can the working group address for your board? And you can see there down at the bottom, need desperately. That's the, those were the top things. And the blue line there, advocating for policy changes. And I think, I think what this tells us more than anything is that the the boards were having, they were struggling to get things done working with cities. That's really what that meant as we dug into it and started to understand more about what the challenges were. The yellow line there was recruiting volunteers. And we've yet to uncover what that really means for these boards. What we think it means is that, you know, they're really struggling to find the time to get the things done that they want to get done. And so they're thinking that volunteers are the answer. And that may be true, that may not be true, as those of you who work with volunteers know. And then one thing that they need a lot, you'll see the green line there, that green bar under need a lot, is partnership and collaboration on grant proposals. And then the purple one there is providing research and examples for decision making. So, you know, I, I see the top four things there as, as understanding policy change, working with volunteers, grant writing, and um, and finding the research, understanding what the basic research says about sustainability and resilience. Next slide. So the other question that we asked is, what kind of training do you need to be more effective? And that's a little bit different than the other question that we had there, but we wanted to know, you know what, what can we do as a working group to help you be more effective? And you can see the number one answers there was how to be an effective board member 
and grant writing. Those are the two big things that they really need help with. The second one there was navigating sunshine laws. I don't know if you all have to deal with this in your states, but in Florida, we are a sunshine state. And I'm not talking about the weather. <laughs> you know, that it's a, it's a legal term referring to any board appointed or government appointed board or committee or elected officials. Um, it's all about transparency and what they do, and it's very complex, complicated. And so these volunteer boards, these committees and volunteer boards fall under sunshine laws, and the average person does not understand this complex law. So they needed a lot of help with that. Next slide. Something to add to your meal right Okay. So on this next slide here, we'll begin exploring our methodology. So Linda already highlighted the needs assessment and in doing so, we were able to actually focus in on what they actually needed. So we were able to use virtual meetings. They were already doing some of that. And with the pandemic last year, it certainly increased, which means their technology savviness also increased with using a virtual platform. Tools and resources, we were able to bring things that we were already using in our professional workspace, whether it was myself or Alicia or Linda or something that UF IFAS extension already had. So we're able to bring tools and resources to the topics that they were in, in need of education on. And then lastly, as you heard us introduce ourselves, we are in different spaces, geographic spaces within the state of Florida. So Alicia is in the Keys and Linda is on the East Coast and I'm on the West Coast and we're all actually doing sustainability work. So we were, we were actually able to leverage our relationships with our cities and counties and bring that to bear. So I think that made it more concrete and real in the sense that we were able to bring that to resonate on the subject matter that these folks were interested in learning about. And then in terms of the, the partners, so Linda mentioned that the board is made up of lots of different people. And actually when we started doing these sessions, um, the Brevard Zoo was a partner. We had the Florida Institute of Technology co-present with us. And some of these are members of the Brevard Working Group. Um, some of them work in the private sector and the nonprofit sector. But again, the needs assessment survey showed that they were lacking in knowledge and skills as it related to sustainability. I think they have the passion and the heart for the work, but they certainly needed a little bit more, more guidance and, and training on the subject matter. And then here we are focused on the topic. So optimizing your board was the first session that we did. We kicked these off in, in June of last year. And then you could see the different uh, subheadings that we worked on. So working with small government, talking about sunshine law, we focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that um, dovetailed really nicely with what was happening on the national landscape. So that certainly worked to our advantage. And then how that would actually connect to sustainable communities, local thriving communities, but more especially working with diverse audiences. Sometimes we hear diversity and we think it's just racial diversity, but it's so much more than that. It's you know, working with different ages, working with different genders, working with older, younger people. And we often hear the complaints about, you know, I don't understand technology. So even getting that diversity in the room and working through some of those. And then lastly, communicating sustainability principles and practices. So we looked at systems thinking, we brought in the sustainable development goals, and we know that communicating sustainability can be a challenge. So that's something that we also um, brought into our session. And if you want to answer the question in the chat box, Alicia is helping me to monitor the chat box. How do you get your team to buy in to the next idea or project? I think this happens even in extension. You know, we, we went from not using Zoom as regularly to being pro users with Zoom. So everybody was definitely maximizing their, their Zoom accounts. And then here we have in terms of results, you know, the virtual platform worked really, really well with the pandemic. People were already utilizing it much more by the time we started this. I build this as a summer series because we started it in June. We did July and August roughly. We had three sessions. This worked and aligned with the existing schedules that they had for meetings. So we weren't actually adding an additional meeting to anybody's calendar. We were taking advantage of something that was already ongoing. And then certainly in the summer, I think boards and, and committees tend to be less um, active, if you would. So it's a good time for us to actually engage in that education. And here, I'll turn it over to Linda. So some of the things that we've seen happen so far, I think are, are really meaningful and impactful, even though this doesn't come down to numbers necessarily. 
Um, I, I think it's 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 really making a difference in in this county. Um, the number of boards have increased, and basically what I mean by that is the number of governments who small governments who have implemented a board or a committee is on the rise. So yay for that. Um, current boards are operating more effectively. I'm hearing um, throughout the county that uh, many of these boards are meeting quorum on a regular basis. So now they're meeting more regularly. There's still a long ways to go, but they're getting better. And that's very positive. Many of these board members, these new board members either came out of the working group, which is um, a big plus, or they are now a member of the working group. Board members are reaching out to the working group for assistance. I think that's a big win for us. That means that they're finally recognizing us as a support group for them. Government officials are attending the working group meetings. I think that is hugely important because that means that they are seeing this as important, not just, not just sustainability and resilience, but they're also seeing the working group as a resource uh, for networking and for information. So I'm really excited to see that. And then our biggest goal, our main goal is we want to be able to dissolve the working group and not have a working group. And in order to do that, governments have to hire full-time sustainability professionals. And we're seeing more governments considering that. They're thinking about putting those into their budget. Maybe they're not going to do it this year, but I think by 2022, we will see a lot more of these small cities having full-time sustainability professionals. And, and that is a huge win, I think, for us. So, you know, in the chat box, how does your team know it met its goal and it's time to move on? I think that's something that anytime we're putting together these kinds of working groups or, or networking groups or anything like that, you need to know when is it time to disband? When is it time to, when have you reached your goals? Those are all really important. So I think we're gonna turn it back over to, no, I think I have one more slide. Yeah, okay. So some of the impacts of this, first of all, we are delivering uh, content based on the need. That's that's where the that that's where the um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. That that's where you know it's really important to do a needs assessment so you know what kind of content is needed. Leveraging our collective skills. You know, one of the points we made with this working group early on is that we all come from different organizations. And we all have different skills, we all have different networks, and we have different resources, but we also have similar skills, similar resources, and similar networks. So we've been able to leverage those with each other and get a lot of work done. We are building capacity. We are building capacity, not just with these, uh, these sustainability groups, but we're building capacity within these small governments as well, because we're also helping them learn how to work with volunteers on a different level. And then we are providing value from extension, extension, extension being the leader of this organization is being recognized as um, an organization that has expertise in this area, subject matter expertise, but also we're being recognized for having these different areas of expertise like diversity, equity, and inclusion and reaching diverse audiences. Extension's not usually looked at as, as an organization that has those kinds of skills or building board capacity, right? The, the, helping people serve on a board. You know, what, what are the skills you need? What kind of strategies can you use? So I think all of those are important things and important impacts that we are seeing. I think I'll turn it over to Alicia now or Ramona. So um, what do we wanna take away from this? What are some of the lessons that we learned? And I think the first lesson that we learned is, and, and I think Extension does this extremely well, is make it relevant to what folks are already engaged in. You know, we didn't ask them to go outside of the work that they were doing. We asked them to work inside with the work that they were already interested in and passionate about. And one thing we found was that by getting groups of people together who ordinarily wouldn't be in the same room, even though it was a virtual space, um, they made connections with each other and now they can rely on each other in a much more positive way and, and can help each other, whether it's with events or capacity and those sorts of things. And then we also learned that we could demonstrate capacity and build capacity like Linda said, within our own extension network, but also build capacity for the community. Next slide, please. And then the emphasis on extension really um, is, is key here because we already have those broad skill sets and competence and interests 
in helping our communities. You know, we're we're invested into each of our communities as county level extension, even regional extension folks. And what can we bring in terms of helping to raise that community up? So whether it's a, a group of sustainability boards or it is, you know, nonprofit organizations within your community, you know, there's still a lot of work that can be done at the community level um, to help raise those folks up. Next slide. And Alicia, Linda, and Ramona, while you're talking, is a question from Bo in the chat. Uh, are these individuals coming to recognize that IFAS Extension <clears throat> has a solid CD program that can help them address some of the key community-related issues they are seeking to address? I'll let <laughs> Linda take Linda's that Linda's already one. getting there. Yeah, good. Yeah, I, I, I answered in the chat box. I think that's a great question, Bo. And you, you know... You know the background of us trying to build CD program in Florida, and I think that yes, I think they are recognizing that, but I don't think they recognize it as community development work. That's not part of their vocabulary, but I think they are reaching out to extension and seeing IFAS as something other than just agriculture and food and, and 4-H, so I think that's a huge positive. I think as, as we build capacity and gain some momentum, we can start working that vocabulary into the conversations that we have. So I'm, I'm excited about that. And then I'll just give you one last thing to sort of think about. I did a little bit of research on what average municipalities have in terms of committees or advisory boards and, and the national average is about 14. And these are generally appointed positions that receive little to no training and, and are, are often very subject specific. So we could think about how board training can really improve outcomes, both for the local government, but also the community. Next slide. And that's it. And there's our contact information if you wanna follow up with us and I will let Ramona close us out. All right, thanks so much everyone for attending today. I'm sure there are a couple of questions or comments in the chat box. I'll stop screen sharing now and then we'll be able to take a look at those um, with the couple minutes that we have left there. Thank you. I just wanna to respond to Wayne's question in the chat box. He says, these boards need help on Robert's rules and running effective meetings and how to engage with the public. I think that is, is very true. And we have heard a lot of, um, I'm gonna say frustrations from these newer board members about how to, how to work within Robert's rules. You know, I think their, their primary challenge has been how to work with the city liaison. So they usually have a liaison that works between the board and between county or city administrators and, and city council. And that's been a real frustration for them as well. Thank you, Melinda. Um, regarding um, uh, training for uh, Robert's Rules of Order, there, there's an organization in Washington State called Jurassic Parliament, uh, run by a former State Department official who does terrific trainings for both elected officials on Robert's Rules of Order, but also for, uh, for nonprofit boards and, and community boards. So Jurassic Parliament and McFarland is the, the, the lead um, uh, executive of that organization. That sounds like it'll be interesting. It'll be a nice compliment to our Jurassic County, which is whatever can go wrong, we need to plan for that. So thanks for sharing that resource, Cliff. Thanks everyone for your time today. We appreciate it. Sure. And thanks to all the presenters for um, great information and sticking to a tight time schedule. We do have a few minutes uh, for open conversation, either in, uh, in, in chat or if you want to raise your hand, I'll try to continue to screen through. I don't see anybody's hand up yet or any questions. So if that's the case, then, oh, here we go. <laughs> um, just a few comments. Great. Uh, so it, it looks like um, it looks like we're free to go. Uh, maybe get a coffee break or, uh, you know, you know where the restrooms are located and, uh, and maybe a snack in the kitchen and then uh, log on for your next session. So thank you everybody for your time and presenters, let's give them 
a round of applause. Thank you very much. All right, great. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.